In this lesson, we will discuss measuring angles. To introduce the idea of an angle, I thought of Elizabeth Tower, which is in London, England, and it houses Big Ben, the bell inside this clock tower. If we zoom in on the face of the clock down here, it appears that it is 2 o'clock, and specifically I think that's 2 p.m. And the thing to notice is that the hour hand and the minute hand create an angle between them. So the angle is measuring how far apart these two hands are spanned from one another. To make this idea a little bit more precise, I'm going to define an angle over here. To construct an angle, you have to have a point. So here, the point would be this spot about which the hands are rotating. And from this point, you have to have two line segments that emanate from it. So in one case, we have the minute hand going in one direction, and then we have the hour hand going in another. And when we talk about the angle, we're talking about how much span there is between those two line segments. So again, we have a point from which two line segments or rays emanate, and the angle is the span between those two line segments. In this lesson, we will be looking at multiple angles at the same time, and thus we'll have to label them. Let me show you how that works. I'm going to call this angle, I guess, angle one. The notation for that is to draw an angle like this with a arc like that after it and then number one. So if you see this notation, it means we are referencing this particular angle. It is the same thing to write an angle and a one after it. So sometimes you'll see this line and sometimes you won't, but we're still talking about this angle. Another way to label angles is to call these points letters. Like we could call this A, B, and C for particular points. So here's point A, here's point B, and here's point C. So we could also call this angle A, B, C. The convention is the letter that's in the middle is the point from which the two rays emanate. So you would not call this angle B, A, C. It would have to be A, B, and then C. So likewise, you could also call this angle C, B, A. As long as this the point at which it emanates is in the middle, then we're good. So that's the definition of an angle and how to label it, but what about measuring it? So for this angle here, when we say measure it, how many degrees does it span going from this line segment to this line segment? And for this, we're asking the question of what is the measure of angle, in this case, one. How many degrees is this angle? First, I'll show you the notation for this. When you're talking about the number of degrees a certain angle has, or the measure of the angle, you don't just write angle 1, but you put the letter m, a lowercase m, before it. So when you see this m, we're talking about the measure of angle 1. If you just see angle 1, we're talking about an angle, but when you see this letter, now we're talking about, well, how many degrees is this? So, can we figure this out? How many degrees does this angle span here on the clock? One approach you could take to figure this out is to use a protractor, which is something that can measure angles, but typically that would only be done on a sheet of paper. I mean, you couldn't take this to the clock tower to actually measure this. But if you had the angle on a sheet of paper, you might be able to line this up to see what angle it's equal to. Um, you know, maybe it's kind of hard to see in here, but it could be about maybe 60 or 70 degrees or so. While this is an okay method, I think we can figure it out exactly. So let's get rid of this. Instead of first trying to figure out the measure of angle 1, which is the angle created by 2 p.m., what is the angle at 3 p.m.? I'm going to draw that down here. So if it is 3 p.m., this is the minute hand and this is the hour hand, what is the angle or the span between these two hands? And it turns out that it's a 90 degree angle. So this is a right angle referenced by this symbol here. So this is 12 and this is three. If you start at noon and first go to one, then to two, then to three, we're dividing this into three equal pieces. So we'd have a piece for one and a piece for the hour of two. So if we take a 90 degree angle and we split it into three equal parts, each of those parts is 30 degrees. So to go from the hour of 12 to 1, that's a 30 degree angle. 
to go from 1 to 2, that's also a 30 degree angle. And from 2 to 3, that's a 30 degree angle as well. So if we start at 12 and go to 2, that's two of those. That's a total of 60 degrees. So in fact, that is the measure of angle 1. That is a 60 degree angle. And this corresponded to 2 p.m. So every time that you go one hour, you've gone 30 degrees. And we know what happens at 2 p.m. and 3 p.m. Well, what would the angle be at 4 p.m.? So here, the angle of 4 p.m. is down here. That's where the four hour is. So that is 30, 60, 90. And then 30 more is going to be 120. So that would be a 120 degree angle. What if it were 6 p.m.? What's that? So in this case, all right, so that's 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, 180. In fact, that is a straight line. If it's 6 p.m., the hour hand is down here. That is a straight line, which does correspond to 180 degrees. And one more. What about 7 p.m.? So we still have the minute hand here, but now the hour hand is here. So it is this angle. Is the answer going to be 30 more from 180 is 210? And it turns out the answer is no. If I draw in here 7 p.m., so here is the hour hand, we're not going to use the larger of the two angles, the one that goes past a straight line. Instead, the convention we will use in this lesson is to use the smaller of the two angles between the two hands. That way, our answer will always be less than 180. So what is this angle here? It's actually the same angle that you'd get at 5 p.m. However, if I count back by the hours from here in this direction, I get 30, 60, 90, 120, 150 degrees. And so that is the angle we would use for 7 p.m. So I'll just say that we have a convention. When we talk about the measure of a given angle, whatever that angle is, we want it to be some positive number, but we also want it to be either equal to 180 or less than it. So we're never going to talk about angles that go beyond a straight line. Now that we have defined angles, let's introduce some terminology to classify them. Here again, I have a protractor, and for this lesson, we are only using angles that go between 0 and 180 degrees. First, I'm going to label some points on this protractor so I can construct different angles. So to start with, I think right here at this center point, I'm going to call this point A. Over here, I'll put point B. Then I'll call this point C. Up here, I'll call that point D. Then here is point E, followed by, and lastly, point F. In example one, I'd like to classify the following angles as either acute, right, obtuse, or straight. And the first one here is angle BAC. What is the measure of the angle created by BAC? Again, noting that since A is in the middle, that's going to be from where the two line segments emanate. So if I draw this angle, this is the angle that we're talking about. By using the protractor, I can see that this is a 20 degree angle. We're starting at zero and ending at 20. So the measure of angle BAC is 20 degrees. And this brings me to the first classification for angles. Anytime that you have an angle that is between 0 and 90 degrees, we will refer to that as acute. So acute means that the measure of the angle, which I'll just call it angle 1, it could be any angle, is between 0 degrees and 90 degrees. Note that the term acute is synonymous with severe or sharp. And when you have an angle that's drawn within this region, it comes to a sharp point or a severe point and that's the reason for this terminology 
All right, now let's look at angle B, A, D. So again, here, this is from where the angle emanates. So I'm gonna draw that one in next. I think it'll go from here to here, then up to point D. So this is angle B, A, D. In fact, it is a 90 degree angle. We have that the measure of angle B, A, D is 90, 90 degrees. And this is what we call a right angle. And it has to be that the measure of the angle is exactly equal to 90 degrees. Okay, let's look at the measure of angle B, A, E. So that's going to be B, A, E. I'll draw that in next. So that's like this. And here we're talking about, it's getting a little crowded, but we're talking about this angle here. And according to the protractor, that is 150 degrees. So the measure of angle B, A, E is 150 degrees. Any angle that is greater than 90 and less than 180 is what we call obtuse. So that's another term, obtuse. If you're greater than 90 degrees, but less than 180, that is an obtuse angle. One synonym of the word obtuse is dull. And if you look at the angle created by BAE, it is not sharp like the acute angle. In fact, it comes to a dull point. Now let's look at the angle BAF. So BA to F, that will go here like this. And for that, that is this angle from here to here. And that is a straight line. Therefore, the measure of angle BAF is equal to 180 degrees. And that is the last term that is a straight angle. And that means the measure of the angle is exactly equal to 180. There is one more angle in here, angle EAF. So that's EAF. What is the measure of this angle? Well, if you go from 150 to 180, the difference of these two numbers is 30. So from 150, if you add 30, you get to 180. And therefore, the measure of that angle, so this one here, EAF, the measure is 30 degrees. Now that we've discussed this terminology, I'd like to add in a couple more definitions. Two angles are called complementary if the sum of their measures is 90 degrees. So if you add their two measures and you get 90 degrees, we'd call those angles complementary. Furthermore, two angles are supplementary if the sum of their measures is 180 degrees. To understand these definitions, I'll pick one of these angles and find a complementary angle and a supplementary angle. And I think I'll use angle B, A, C. The way I'll phrase this question is, what is the complement of angle B, A, C? The measure of angle B, A, C is 20 degrees. And you wanna add something to that so you get 90 degrees. So what we're looking for is a 70 degree angle. And that angle is C, A, D. When you put B, A, C and C, A, D together, you've got a total of 90 degrees. So for this reason, the complement of angle B, A, C is angle C, A, D. If you add their angle measurements together, you get 90. What about the supplement of angle B, A, C. So for this one, again, we know that the measure of angle B, A, C is 20 degrees. We're now looking to add something to it, so we get 180 degrees. So here's 20 degrees. I want an angle that's going to take us all the way to 180. That has to be angle C, A, F. If you put these two together, you go 20, and then you go 160 more to get to 180. So for this reason, the answer is angle C, A, F. And the reason for this is that angle, the measurement of it is 160 degrees. In both of these answers, 
I actually picked angles that were connected that were adjacent to this original angle. Technically, this does not need to be true. Anytime that you have angles, even if they're not connected to each other, if you add their measurements together and get either 90 or 180, we'd call those complementary or supplementary. In example two, I'm going to draw angles on this protractor and we will eventually solve for variables X and Y. Here, I flipped the protractor upside down so I could measure my angles going in this direction. Unfortunately, that means all of the numbers appear backwards. First, I'm going to draw an angle on the protractor and let's say it looks like this. So here's one of the angles. And the second angle is this one here. And these two are on the same line. If the measure of this angle here is 36 degrees, then what is the measure of the other angle, which I'll call x degrees? So it appears that these two angles are complementary. If you add them together, you've got a total of 90 degrees. So because these are complementary angles, we can say that 36 plus x is equal to 90, and these are all in degrees. To solve for x, this is simple enough to do. You can subtract 36 from both sides of your equation. On the left, they cancel, and we're left with just x. And on the right, we have 90 minus 36. Uh, 90 minus um, 40 is 50, so therefore it's going to be 54 degrees. And this is the answer for not just the measure of this angle, but for the variable x as well. Let's try another one just for a little bit more practice. So I'm going to draw in two new angles. I'll put one here, and I guess the other one maybe I'll draw somewhere over here. So here's one angle, and the second angle is going to be here. So I have this angle and this angle. Let's assume that this angle here is given by the expression, we'll say 3y plus 5, so that number of degrees. And then the smaller of the two angles is given by maybe 2y plus 10 degrees. Can we use this information to solve for y? We can use a similar process over here. I think it'll be more complicated just because the expressions are more complicated. But these two angles are complementary because they add to 90 degrees. I can take this expression and add it to this and also set it equal to 90. I have this equation, 3y plus 5 plus 2y plus 10 is 90. From here, I want to get y by itself on the left side of the equation. I think a good starting point is to combine like terms. 3y and 2y can be combined because they're the same type of thing. We have 3 of one and 2 of the other. That means we have a total of 5y. The numbers are like terms, so I can combine those. 5 and 10 is 15. There are no more like terms on the left or the right. At this stage, we can now solve for y, first by getting rid of the 15, and then by getting rid of the 5. To undo addition of 15, I can subtract 15 from both sides of the equation. On the left, these cancel to 0. I don't have to write it. 5y is left over. On the right, 90 minus 15 is 75. We're close. We want y by itself, but there's 5 being multiplied to the y. To undo multiplication, we can use division. Divide both sides by 5. On the left, 5 over 5 is 1. I don't have to write that, but y is certainly left over. On the right, okay, 5 goes into 75 15 times. And this is the value of y. Now this time, y is not technically degrees in that it really doesn't tell you the size of either of these two angles. This was not asked for the question, uh, but what is the size of this angle? And what is the size of this one? To figure it out, you can take 15, put it into this expression, and it should tell you how big this angle is. So the measure of this angle is the same thing as saying 2 times 15 plus 10. That's 30 plus 10, that's 40. So this angle is 40 degrees. What about this angle here? Well, if these are complementary, and this is 40, this has got to be 50. 
So if I put 15 here, this should simplify to 50. Let's see if that happens. That is 3 times 15 plus 5. 3 times 15 is 45, and 5 more is 50. So here's a check that, okay, we did solve for y. It technically didn't tell us the measure of the angles. But by substituting 15 in place of y, it did. And what do you know? These do, in fact, sum to give us 90 degrees. I'd like to use example 3 to introduce a definition called vertical angles. Here we have two intersecting lines, meaning they meet at a single point, and I've labeled the four angles as angle 1, 2, 3, and 4. By definition, we call vertical angles ones that are opposite of each other in intersecting lines. So angle 1 and angle 3 are vertical. Angle 2 and angle 4 are vertical as well because they are across from each other. What fact do you think we can deduce about vertical angles, that is angle 1 and angle 3, and angles 2 and 4? It turns out that the measure of these angles are equal. Specifically, the measure of angle 1 is equal to the measure of angle 3. They're the same size. Also, the measure of angle 2 is equal to the measure of angle 4. It's not always true that the measure of angle 1 is equal to the measure of angle 2, because those are not vertical, but these are equal and those are equal. For me, I feel looking at this diagram, it is intuitively true that vertical angles are equal, but you can actually also prove this fact, and I'd like to take a second to do that. That is, angle one and angle three are equal. The same argument can be used to show that angles two and four are equal. First, what can you say about the measure of angle one plus the measure of angle two? What if you add those two angles together? So the measure of angle 1 plus the measure of angle 2. Well, they form a straight line. They're supplementary, and therefore they equal 180 degrees. What can you say about the measure of angle 2 and the measure of angle 3 if you add those together? Well, they're also supplementary, and they also equal 180 degrees. That is the measure of angle 2 plus the measure of angle 3 that equals 180 as well. This is the same thing as 180. This is the same thing as 180. You can set these two things equal to each other because they're both equal to the same thing, 180 degrees. So if we combine these two together, we can say the measure of angle one plus the measure of angle two, it's true it's equal to 180, but it's also equal to the measure of angle two plus the measure of angle three. This represents a number, so does this this, and this. But here we have the same number on both sides of the equation. You can subtract the measure of angle 2, whatever it is, from both sides of the equation, and it cancels them. They become 0 here and here. We have an equality that's left over. The measure of angle 1 is equal to the measure of angle 3. So here's a proof that vertical angles are equal in measure. The same argument could be used for any vertical angles, including these two here. All that being said, I want to solve for x. I'm going to put expressions in this diagram that depend on x. For the measure of angle 1, I'm going to call this 13x minus 20 degrees. And for the measure of angle 3, I'm going to say that's 8x plus 40 degrees. How can I use this information to solve for x? Well, these two angles have to have the same measurement. Therefore, what we can say is 13x minus 20 is equal to 8x plus 40. They're, in fact, the same. To solve this equation, there are no like terms on either the left or the right, so we can start adding or subtracting things from one side of the equation to the other. There's more than one way to do this, but I'm going to add 20 to both sides, which will cancel it here. So I'll add 20. And this equation becomes 13x plus 0, which I won't write. And then we have 8x plus 60. I want all of the x's by themselves, so I'm going to subtract 8x to the other side of the equation. So minus 8x minus 8x. And if you take... 8 things from 13 things, you have 5 of those left over. That's 5x. 8x from 8x is 0. I won't write it. 
and on the other side we have 60. To solve for x, I can divide both sides by 5. The reason is 5 is being multiplied to x. Division will cancel it, leaving me with just x. So 5 goes into 60 a total of 12 times. And here we completed what the question was asking for, solving for x. There is this other part. It says, well, using this information, can you find the actual measure of angle 2? To figure this out, I need to know the measure of angle either 1 or 3. I'll try to figure out the measure of angle 1. Since we know x is 12, I can put 12 in place of x and simplify this expression to get an actual number for this angle. I'll put that up here. So that is 13 times 12 minus 20. All right, I'm going to do that one in my calculator. 13 times 12 minus 20. That is 136, and that is degrees. Okay, that is the measure of this angle. This angle and this angle are supplementary. It means they add to 180. If you want the measure of angle 2, what we will do is take 180 and subtract 136. The amount that's left over has to be the measure of this angle. So 180 minus 136 is 44. So the measure of angle 2 is equal to 44 degrees. In example 4, in this diagram, we are given two parallel lines. That means they're running in the same direction and therefore will never intersect. However, both of the parallel lines are intersected by this line here. And the name of this line is called a transversal, a fancy name for a line that intersects other lines. If we are told the measure of this angle, angle X is 109 degrees, can we find the measures of all of the remaining angles, angles 1 through 7? To start with, angle X and angle 3 are vertical angles, and therefore they have the same measure. So, since the measure of angle X, this angle here, is 109 degrees, well, so is the measure of angle 3. This has to be 109 degrees as well. Furthermore, angle 1 and angle X are supplementary. That means these have to add to 180 degrees. What do you add to 109 in order to get to 180? One more takes you up to 110, and 70 more takes you up to 180. Therefore, the angle here, angle 1, that must be equal to 71 degrees. And the reason for this is angles X and 1, they are supplementary. And if you add 109 and 71, that is equal to 180. For angle 2, angle 3 and angle 2 are also supplementary. But at the same time, angle 1 and angle 2 are vertical angles. Therefore, they must be equal in measure. I know that the measure of angle 2 is also 71 degrees. So I'll write these out. We know the measure of angle 1 is equal to 71. The measure of angle 2, that is 71 degrees as well. And the measure of angle 3 is equal to 109. To figure these out, we just use facts from the previous slides. Now, what about these angles down here, 4, 5, 6, and 7? If you were to guess the answers for their measures, I bet you could reason it out. I mean, the way this diagram is drawn, it looks like angle 4 and angle X are the same, and therefore they should have the same measure. And the same goes for angles 1 and 5. This is for sure true. What's the reason for this? The way I'd argue it is, if you took this part of the diagram and you dragged it up here, they would perfectly overlap one another. For this reason, the measure of angle 4, it's the same as the measure of angle X, which is 109 degrees. The same can be said for the remaining angles, 5, 6, and 7. 6 is the same as 2, 7 is the same as 3, and 5 is the same as 1. So the measure of angle 5, that was equivalent to the measure of angle 1, and the measure of angle 1 was 71. The measure of angle 6, that's equivalent to the measure of angle 2, and that was 71 degrees. And lastly, the measure of angle 7 is equal to the measure of angle 3, which is 109 degrees. Before moving on, if we go back up to this diagram, 
what angles are equal to each other in measure? So that was x and 3 and 4 and 5. Those were kind of the obvious ones. 1 and 2 and 5 and 6, and those were obvious as well. I'd like to focus on the measure of angle 2 and the measure of angle 5. Are those equal to each other? If this is your starting point, it is not obvious, but it turns out they are equal to each other. Angle 2 is 71, but this is equal to 71 as well, so this angle is equal to this one. Uh, likewise, is the measure of angle 4 equal to the measure of angle 3? And the answer to that is also yes. 4 is equal to 7, and 7 is equal to 3. So we know that the measure of angle 4 is equal to the measure of angle 3. These angles, 2 and 5, as well as 3 and 4, they have a name. These are called alternate interior angles. They're given this term because they are equal to each other. That is, the alternate, they're on opposite sides of the transversal. Interior, because they are on the inside part of the parallel lines, 2 is equal to 5. 3 is equal to 4. They are alternate and on the interior of the parallel lines. Likewise, what about the measure of angle x and the measure of angle 7? Are those equal to each other? And the answer to this one is they are both also 109 degrees. 109 degrees is the same thing as the measure of angle 3, which is the same thing as the measure of angle 7. So this angle is equal to this one. I'll draw that in like this. Here's the angle for x. Here's the angle for 7. Those things are equal. What about 6 and 1? Do they have the same measurement? Definitely. 1 is equal to 2, and 2 is equal to 6. Therefore, the measure of angle 1 is equal to the measure of angle 6. See, I left off the measure for that part there. There's a term for these as well. These are alternate because they're on opposite sides of the transversal. X is opposite to 7. And then 6, which I'll label here, 6 is opposite the transversal to 1. Those are equal as well, but they're not interior. They're exterior because they're on the outside of the parallel lines. So these are called alternate exterior angles. If you start with this diagram and nothing was labeled, it might not be obvious that this angle equals this one or this angle is equal to that one. But now that we've seen these facts, you can always assume that those things are true. And now for the last example in this lesson, I'd like to look at an application of these topics as well as an interesting piece of trivia. And so that is, the circumference of Earth is about this many miles, 24,901 miles. When I say the circumference, I mean a distance around the planet that splits it into two equal pieces. So the Arctic Circle would not be a circumference, but the equator is. In fact, it's a great circle. It splits the world into two equal pieces. Or if I started here and went around this way, uh, this greatest distance would be the circumference of the Earth. So my question is, when in history was this first accurately estimated? So make a guess. What do you think? When did this happen? Okay, this was figured out by the ancient Greeks. In fact, uh, the person who did it was Eratosthenes. Eratosthenes. And this was approximately 200 BC, which that's a really long time ago, and that makes this a pretty surprising result. This was not figured out by traveling around the planet. In fact, this was figured out by using the distance between two towns in Egypt. One of those, which is roughly here, that was Syene, and then another one over here was Alexandria. And the distance between these two towns is about 500 miles. So Eratosthenes reasoned this. If you draw 
a line from each of these towns going to the center of Earth like this, it creates an angle here, which I'll call X, whose measure I don't know. Eratosthenes wants to know the distance around Earth, the circumference of the spherical planet. So let's call that D. You know, we don't know what that is. But since we are on a sphere, Eratosthenes knew, well, this corresponds to 360 degrees. This distance corresponds to this number in terms of an angle measurement. Now, we know this distance. Uh, this is 500 miles. And that corresponds to some angle, but we just don't know what that angle is. And right now I'm just calling that x. These things are proportional. That is, if you divide the distance around to the distance here, you get a fraction. That fraction is equal to the number of angles that you go around divided by this angle measurement here. So if you look at this equation and you want to solve for d, you know 500, you know 360 degrees, the only thing you need to know is x. Eratosthenes knew, if I could measure this angle, which is at the center of the Earth, then I can figure out the total distance around the planet. So how do we solve for x? The way this was done was by using shadows from the sun. There was a certain day and time during the year where the sun came in directly above, casting no shadows here. So you could think of a ray of light from the sun coming in as a straight line like this. It hits here and it travels through here. Now at that exact same moment up here in Alexandria, it does cast a shadow. So you can draw a line parallel to this one going through this spot here. And maybe just to exaggerate this a bit, I'll expand it out. But a ray of light would come in parallel like this. So at one moment of one day, there's no shadow cast here, but over here there is one. How does this help us figure out the angle for x? Well, this is a parallel line, this is a parallel line, and this is a transversal that cuts those two parallel lines. What do you know about this angle and this angle here? This angle can actually be measured because it's outside on the Earth's surface, and it's equal to this one here because these are alternate interior angles. So we didn't directly measure this angle, but we could directly measure this one, and they did. And they figured out that, well, this angle measurement, so I'll say the measure of angle X, was roughly 7 degrees. That's it. The second you know this, you can put this number right here. The only thing you don't know in your equation is D, but that is the distance you're looking to solve for. Let's plug it in. So that's D over 500 is equal to, I'll say, 360 over 7. To solve for D, you can multiply 500 to the other side of this equation. D is equal to 360 times 500 divided by 7. I'm going to use a calculator to figure out this number. The number I get for D is 25,714.3 miles. Now that is a great estimate for what we know the value is today. This was done without leaving this region of the world, and it was done also using the facts that we talked about in the lesson today.